Last video we learned from the official documentation of Ledger about JTAG. That sounds really cool, so let's investigate that more. On the STM32 description page you can scroll down and find resources about development tools, specifically to an ST-Link in Circuit Debugger and Programmer for STM8 and STM32 MCUs. This device can do JTAG or SWD stuff. SWD stands for Serial Wire Debug. So very similar to JTAG but something ARM specific. It basically has only two wires for data. We also don't really need to buy that device because I got a cool tip from Thomas. He told me I should just get a development board for the STM32. A development board is like an Arduino. It's a board with the chip you want to build something with and all the pins are exposed and you can build a proof of concept before you actually design your product with a PCB. And this STM32 has to be programmed and possibly debugged as well. So these boards might come with a built-in ST-Link. So here I have an official Nucleo board from ST Microelectronics with an STM32. Now I have a different STM32 on here, the F446RE, but that doesn't matter because we are interested in this part of the PCB. See this gap here? They are here because you could even just break it off. That part basically is the ST-Link component and you see here the ST-Link is connected to the Nucleo via some jumpers. A jumper just connects two pins together. So if you take out those jumpers then you just have a bare ST-Link here and the serial wire debug pin headers are exposed here. And on there it also says SWD. In the general user documentation for the Nucleo board you can also find some details about this SWD debug connector. So that CN4 connector has six pins, but the sixth one is reserved and not used right now. Usually the first pin is also marked by something like a dot. Next we have to somehow connect this to the ledger. First is VDD, that's the plus five volt of the target. The second one is the SWD clock signal. The third just connects to ground. Then we have the SWD IO pin. That one is the actual data carrying pin and we have an exposed reset line that can be used by the ST-Link to reset the target chip. So how do we connect this to the ledger? Let's assume we haven't seen this convenient line of pins on the bottom side of the ledger's PCB and let's look at the STM32F042 datasheet. So we are looking for power, ground, SWD IO, SWD clock and reset. In the pinout table we can find them. SWD IO is pin PA13 and SWD clock is pin PA14. And every chip also has a reset pin, in this case it appears to be called NRST. Here's the package pinout how the chip looks from the top. And PA13 and PH14 are over here. And reset is here. Now how do you know which way you have to look at the chip? The text is a bit misleading because what you need to look for is a symbol like this dot. This indicates the top left corner. So these two pins that disappear into the PCB should be SWD IO and SWD CLK. And to verify that we have the correct orientation we can also check these two pins. These go directly to the USB and in the pin definition table we see that PA12 and PA11, so the two pins right below PA13 and PA14, are in fact for USB. So theoretically we just hook up the ST-Link board to those pins, but luckily when we follow these two pins on the back side of the PCB we see that they connect to these two pads. The center is connected to the crown plane, so that is GND, and this one seems to connect to the other side of the chip where reset is located. So that should be reset, and this must be VDD the plus five volt power supply. So this matches exactly our SWD connector pinout. So let me solder some cables to it so we can easily connect it to the board. Here's how I did it. I have some small generic hold perf boards that can be used for prototyping PCBs. I got them in different formats and there's this long one that could fit nicely. I noticed that the pad spacing matches exactly the 2.54mm or 0.1 inch hole grid. 
So my plan, not sure if that works, is just to lay the ledger PCB on it like this, put a lot of solder on this side and hope it flows down onto the PCB and connects the whole thing. Not sure if that's a good idea, but it seemed reasonable to me at the moment. So I got my soldering iron and all the equipment I might need ready. Probably should use a different solder tip and then let's make a plan. To keep it in place I thought maybe using some electrical tape but that kind of failed. My second idea was to apply a bit of solder and make the solder spiking up a bit so I can just stick those into the holes. And you can see here barely the pointy end. And then I tried electrical tape again but failed. Just always slips off a bit. Then I thought I could use a piece of wire to make a kind of like a pin sticking up and then put it on the PCB but unfortunately the only wire I had was way too thick. So in the end I just carefully laid it on top and applied solder and crossed my fingers. And to my surprise that worked. It seems to hold and has flown down onto the pad. So I do it on all five holes and here's the result. You can clearly see the solder being on the PCB. Next I would like to add some nice pins to the PCB so I can connect some wires to the ST-Link. Let's quickly check my electronics supply. There are some pins. I think I will take some 90 degree ones so they stick out to the other side. And the whole thing stays flat. Something like this would be cool. So now I just have to connect these solder spots with these pins. And that sounds easier than it is because solder is really like sticking to the pads and make them cross over the solder protection layer, the green stuff, is tricky. As you can see I just splash a bunch of solder on these three pins and just can't get them connected. And thanks to gravity it just accumulates on the other side. So I gotta remove some of the solder with this copper mesh that acts like a sponge and just sucks up the liquid solder. Then I decided to use some short snippets of wire from earlier and use that as a simple bridge connection. And that works really well. Cool. Before I connect it I want to do a small sanity check and make sure that I didn't accidentally cause a short. So I use a continuity tester to check if two pins are electrically connected. And it looks all pretty good, none of them are shorted. But then this is the moment I realized something else. Do you see it? I give you a second to notice it while I'm just looking at it and trying to process how that happened. You see, I screwed up and soldered the connector one pin off. See that dot here? That is the spike of the solder pin we did earlier. That is supposed to be the first pin. And this back there, there's no pin below at all. God damn it, I'm an idiot. So that was annoying but I fixed it, so here we go. This looks good now. Next, let's get the nuclear board and hook up the cables. I'm checking again that I got the order of cables right, but looks all good. Moment of truth, plugging in the USB cable will still turn on or did I screw up soldering? Uh, well, I didn't expect that. So I disconnected the board from the nuclear again and tried it and then the screen turned on. Huh, okay, so it just didn't work because of the debug connection. But then I reconnected the nuclear again to just reproduce that and suddenly the screen turned on as well. What is going on? Well, in any way, we can now connect the nuclear via USB and then we can try out the debugging interface. But immediately when the USB plug touched the USB connector, the ledger reset. I'm sure that's not any reason to be concerned, it's probably what is supposed to happen. And let's take some electrical tape and secure the ledger and the screen on the PCB. Looks pretty neat. I have to say, I like now how that worked out. So let's connect everything to the laptop and try the tools. I will show those tools in a second, but it didn't work. I was staring at the setup and realized, oops, I had those wires connected wrong. Gosh, I'm so happy that I haven't destroyed the ledger yet, but if we keep going like that, it won't work for much longer. Awesome. Now let's try this. I have ST-Link installed on my Mac and then we can, for example, run ST-Info to get some chip description. And it answers. It's a F04 device, STM-F04. Let's try the real thing, ST-Util. It finds the device, also prints the SRAM and flash size, 
And now the GDB server is listening on port 4242. Woo! Okay, now we need a special GDB to debug this ARM code. This is pretty simple. Just uh, search for ARM non ARB download and you will find the official ARM embedded toolchain and you can grab the tools for your system, in my case, Mac OS X. Once you get that, you just start the ARM non ARB GDB and connect to a remote target, localhost port 4242. Boom! It worked. We can now continue and with control C just break at any point, inspect the registers and even disassemble some instructions. But this disassembly looks wrong. Unlike Intel Assembler where instructions can have different byte lengths, ARM instructions are always 32 bit long. But there are also thumb instructions and they are 16 long. And in this case this runs thumb code. And to tell GDB to disassemble this as thumb instead, we ask it to disassemble at address plus one. So an odd address. Because of this instruction alignment, you always have instructions at even numbers, right? Instructions are either two or four bytes long. So you shouldn't think of this plus one as an odd address, but rather an address that has the last bit set. And this is convention to tell you this is now a thumb code. You might also see this when disassembling ARM and there's a jump or branch instruction to an odd address. It's not an odd address, it's an address that has the last bit set and that means it's switching to thumb instructions from here on out. Anyway, this way GDB will also interpret this as thumb and show us now the real instructions. Now we can use GDB to debug the device, cool huh? One last thing, we can use stflash to read the whole flash and create a backup dump of the whole flash. We start to dump the memory from 8000, that's the start of the flash, and then we read 32768 bytes, which is hex 8000, the size of the flash. And this memory dump contains the whole firmware.